Thanks very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and thank you all for coming out so, so early on a Saturday morning. Um, so my, my job in the next uh, 18 minutes is to really take you a little bit about um, how the immune system has really played such a key role in this disease of type 1 diabetes. For, just to remind people, there are two types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. And type 2 is a diabetes you may hear a lot about, which is associated often with lifestyle, has, um, has, has been known as the disease that's associated with obesity. And it's the disease that you make insulin, you make the material you need to treat your blood sugar, but you don't, unfortunately, you don't respond to it well. Type 1 diabetes is totally different. And as I'll try to uh, share with you in the next few minutes, is it's really a disease uh, of the immune system. So um, what do I mean when I say it's a disease of the immune system? Okay, so the immune system is effectively a body at war. We're constantly trying to deal with the, uh, the viruses, bacteria, and various, next slide please, sorry and the various uh, pathogens that we come in contact with. So the immune system does this by developing a whole series, a whole armament of uh, white blood cells, T cells, B cells, and other cells that are all designed to seek out, attack, and destroy. Okay, okay. So as I was saying, um, the good news is that the immune system is really designed to recognize and destroy all of the, uh, of the pathogens that we come in contact, be viruses or bacteria, and it also surveils against cancer. So all of us may get cancer every day, but the immune system is getting rid of it in, in the majority of us most of the time. And then finally, the immune system is critical for repair, tissue repair. When you get an injury, the immune system comes up and repair. But as, a, as you know, next slide please, is there's a bad side to this immune system. And how many people in the room know somebody that has one of these diseases, be it rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, or type 1 diabetes? I'll bet you everybody would raise their hand, right? Just raise your hand if any of these things, okay? These are all diseases that have a common cause, and that is the immune system, which is so keyed up to try to recognize foreign things, like viruses and bacteria, makes a mistake. And instead of just recognizing something foreign, it starts seeing your own tissue whether it's your own islets of Langerhans in the pancreas, which causes type 1 diabetes, or your own brain, which causes multiple sclerosis, or your joints, which causes rheumatoid arthritis. It all starts from the same thing, which is the immune system's mistake. So um, the immune system destroys your beta cells in type 1 diabetes. Now just to remind people, the pancreas is a fairly large organ, about this big, and it's designed to do two things. One is to produce insulin, which is a hormone that controls your blood sugar, and the other is to produce other enzymes that help you digest your food, the exocrine tissue. But within that pancreas, those cells that make insulin are the so-called islets of Langerhans. And here's a picture of an islets of Langerhans right here, and you can see the green, and that's a stain that we use to identify cells making insulin. And you can see here that around this islet are, I'll point to you when I want it, okay? Uh, around these um, islets of, of Langerhand are other cells. That's the exocrine tissue seen here. And then within the islets is these um, insulin producing cells. When you have type 1 diabetes, the immune system comes in, and you can see some of the immune cells here in red. It comes in and it destroys these insulin producing cells. So you see you've lost the green because you've lost the cells that are making insulin. And it's because the immune system recognizes proteins on these cells that are self proteins that it attacks inadvertently and destroys it. Oh, this is gonna work great. Okay, and here's a picture of that happening. If you could start the movie, please. By, if you just move the mouse over the movie. And what happens is this red cells here are the immune system coming in, and you can see these eyelets getting destroyed. Maybe you can click it again. Maybe it'll go again. And you can just see them disappearing because as these red cells come in and attack the islets, it destroys those cells. So this is an active attack, just like it would be an active attack on your brain or an active attack on your joint and other diseases. Here, your T cells come in, they recognize the islets and destroy them. Next slide. So how come this happens in people? It doesn't happen in, in most of us, but it happens in a few select people. And we now understand a lot more about what the etiology or cause of this disease is. 
And it really is fundamentally based on three overlapping things that come together in those individuals who are susceptible and get the disease. There's a genetic component, and we'll talk a little bit about that. There's an immunological component, how this whole thing gets started. And then there's an environmental component. And so for the rest of the time, I'm going to talk about each of these components and how key they are when they come together to cause this disease. Let's start with the immunological component. Okay? So as I said, this disease is a disease of the immune system. And the immune system starts by developing in an organ above the heart called the thymus. Most people don't know about the thymus or think about the thymus unless they eat sweetbreads because it's not an organ we, we come into very often. But it's an organ that's absolutely key for the development of the immune system because cells come out of your bone marrow and go through the thymus and when they come out of the thymus, they're now fully educated to recognize these foreign viruses and bacteria and other um, pathogens that they might come in contact with. So the bone marrow comes in and the thymus is like a filter. It's like going through a filter. The cells that are good, the ones that are designed to see viruses and bacteria, they get selected here, expanded, and come out the other end. The cells that are bad, cells that see your self proteins by mistake, they largely get destroyed and die and never make it out of the thymus. And then interesting, there's even a third population of cells that come out, and those cells are designed to control or regulate the immune response so that if there are mistakes, those cells come out and they protect you instead and make sure that you don't inadvertently respond to self tissues. The problem in people who are prone to autoimmune diseases, like I've mentioned, is the thymus has defects. And the defects mean that the good cells come out to see bacteria and viruses fine, but some of the cells that should have died, that should have been eliminated, they come out as well. And these regulatory cells, which are so important to control immune responses that you don't want, they're somewhat defective and they don't come out in the same numbers. And so the end result with people who are prone to type 1 diabetes is they have an immune system that's imbalanced. That instead of just having all the good cells and none of the bad cells, it has this uh, leakiness and the bad cells come out. Okay, and so what happens then is that when some of these bad cells, these self-reactive, auto-reactive cells come in contact with the beta cell or other cells that are expressing uh, antigens by the beta cell, and these are some of the antigens like insulin itself can be recognized with people with type 1 diabetes. These T cells get activated by those uh, antigens, those self antigens that are present on uh, the beta cell or cells associated with the beta cell. And then it turns those cells into these killer cells, these angry cells that I showed you actually destroy the beta cells. And these cells go into the pancreas and they actually attack the islet itself and destroy the islet. And so we now know a lot more about what those mechanisms are. We know what's key to turning on this T cell in the first place. We know what the autoantigens are. We know how that recognition takes place, which I'll talk about in a second. And we also know a lot about what the consequence of that activation is, how this T cell comes in and starts wiping out the beta cells. So we now have a lot, and, and, and Dr. Von Harreth will talk about, we now have a lot of approaches that are designed to try to attack various parts of this pathway to see if we can prevent this activation and then subsequent destruction. Next slide. Oh, sorry. On top of all of that, I talked about this regulation, which is key, this specialized subset of cells. This whole job it is to shut down this process if it's going awry. And as I mentioned, in people with type 1 diabetes, there's often a defect in these cells as well. So you can see it's a very complicated and dynamic system that we're trying to intervene here if we're going to cure diabetes. And what you'll hear a lot about today from von, Dr. Von Harreth and Dr. Insel are approaches that are being done to try to change the course of this disease by trying to change how these different T cells respond in different settings. Okay. So that's how the immune system is doing it. But why does that happen in people with type 1 diabetes? And, and that has to do a lot with the genetics of an individual. Okay. If you start looking, what you can see is that if, if there's a lifelong risk of diabetes of 6% in, in, in offspring of people with type 1 diabetes, that's on a background of well less than 1% of the total population. So if you have a parent who has type 1 diabetes, you have a much higher risk. If you have a sibling with type 1 diabetes, you have a much higher risk. If you're an identical twin, if one twin has diabetes, the odds of the other twin getting diabetes is about 30%. 
So we knew early on there's a genetics to this disease that puts people in a position um, of being more at risk. And people who are identical twins have a much higher risk than people who are fraternal or non-identical twins, again suggesting the importance of the genetics. And if you now look at the genetics and what are the genes that are responsible, there are a lot of genes now that have been implicated in this disease, but two genes in particular really stand out as really increasing the risk. One I'll talk about for a second is this so-called HLA genes, which if you remember from an earlier slide was on it, it's very important for how those T cells do their first recognition, and I'll get to that. And the second is insulin itself that insulin itself turns out to be expressed normally in people in the thymus, and that's why the cells get deleted in the thymus before they come out. But in people who have the, this genetics of insulin, it appears that it's not expressed in the same levels in the thymus, and therefore those self-reactive, autoreactive, bad T cells escape from the thymus. Next slide. And so the HLA works as a lock and key system. We have these T cells, which I've talked about, which get activated, when they see self-antigen, and they see it in the context of these HLA molecules. So what happens is these self-proteins get processed into very small peptides composed of amino acids. And that binds, think of this like a hot dog bun, that you have the hot dog bun and the hot dog is sitting in the middle, this kind of peptide. The T cell comes along and it sees the peptide MHC complex and gets activated. In most healthy people, these T cells don't exist. But in people who are prone to autoimmune diabetes, these T cells escape the thymus, and you can see them here interacting, and this is actually a, a real structure that's been solved, crystallography of that recognition. And so you get that perfect lock and key that I'm talking about where the connector is there. And it's that lock and key which shows you the increase. We can now detect people before they're diabetic who have a very high risk of having diabetes based on their genetics and based on the presence of autoantibodies, the first sign of diabetes. And here just shows you how if you have this shared um, autoantibody positive in the shared genetic risk, you can see this dramatic increase. And you can see again how much that increase occurs in diabetes. So the genetics are absolutely key to the development of this disease. Okay, here's another example. If you've just started getting the disease, the chance of getting full disease is relatively low. But if you started making autoantibodies against insulin and some of these other proteins so that you have three different types of autoantibodies that you've detected, you can see how high the risk is. So the genetics here are incredibly strong. Next slide. And let's just talk a little bit about environment. You know, I made the comment before that in identical twins, about 30% of identical twins, both twins get diabetes. Well, on the one side, you say, gee, that means there's a lot of genetics involved, okay? But on the other side, is what about those 70% that don't get it? Why is it that if you have an identical genome, if your genes are identical, only one-third of the twins, both twins, get diabetes? And the answer is the environment is going to play a very important role in determining who gets uh, this disease ultimately. And so... The hidden secret now is the environment seems to be playing an absolutely growing role in the development of this disease because what we're now seeing is a dramatic increase in the incidence of, of this disease over time. Here's the incidence of disease in various countries. You can see the U.S. here. There are countries like Finland, again, because of the genetics, the genetics of the Finnish population that have very high incidence of type 1 diabetes compared to a Japan which has an amazing low incidence. So this tells you, again, about the genetics in the different populations. But if you look at the next second here, you also can see what's happening over time. And if you look over the past um, 50 years or so, you can see that in every setting, the increased incidence of diabetes over time. So here's the genetics, and then here's the environment. There is something going on that is increasing the incidence of this disease and boosting this immune system so that it is more likely to result in, in type 1 diabetes. So the idea is now out there of what we call the hygiene hypothesis, which basically says that it's a lack of exposure to infectious agents that kind of educate our immune system. You know, every hear people say you eat a pound of dirt, right? It's good. And we now think that how the immune system gets organized happens very early in life. And exposure to bacteria and viruses is actually helpful in training the immune system so that it learns to recognize things that are foreign and not things that are self. 
And in fact, the incidence of type 1 diabetes is most prevalent in first world countries where our hygiene has gotten better over decades. And you can just see here that as our, um, our incidence of infection diseases have gone down, the incidence of many autoimmune diseases have gone up. So there's a connection between our exposure to infectious agents and diabetes. Next slide. So we know there are some viruses that are probably playing a role in this. And we think there's accumulating evidence that things in our diet may be playing a role in this. So we're working on that. Next slide. And so to summarize, what have I told you? There's a lot of genetic predisposition so that people who come from families with high incidence of type 1 diabetes are more likely. There are environmental influences that over time seem to be triggering these T cells that are reactive against cell proteins that escape thymic selection. That that leads to the production of these autoantibodies, seeing these self-antigens and T cells that recognize these self-antigens. So that over time you destroy your beta cell mass and then at some point you get so little beta cell mass left that you actually start seeing clinical signs of type 1 diabetes. So you can imagine that there are different places we might be able to intervene. We can't intervene right now genetically, but we certainly can think about environmental interventions. We can think about intervening in this disease early on. So to summarize then, the whole story of type 1 diabetes and other immune diseases is all about balance, immune balance. Balancing this immune system that's designed to see foreign and occasionally see self with the regulation that keeps it under control. That viruses and other things can cause inflammation and other things that can do it. And so we're like this elephant that all the scientists are looking at the different pieces of this puzzle. Looking at the beta cell, looking at these chemical cytokines, looking at the T cell that I've talked a lot about today, or this regulatory population, or the genes, or the environment, and trying to put these pieces together so that we can now intervene in this disease, stop it before it starts, or if it starts, stop it before it causes diabetes. And I'll stop there. Thanks.